Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Minterburn Presbyterian Church and the Sunday morning service for Caledon and Minterburn Presbyterian Churches. And our call to worship this morning is from one of the Psalms. It says, I love to go through the calls of worship. And it says, uh, the Psalms writes, Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering, come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth, say among the nations. The Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved and he will judge the peoples with equity. And we are going to worship our God. And um, we're maybe a hymn you wouldn't necessarily expect me to announce for our first hymn. This is going to be our topic for later in the service. We are going to sing Spirit of God Unseen as we not. Thank you that we've not been left alone. 
have not been left as orphans and forgive us for so often living as though we have been. And Lord, we come to you as your sons and daughters and we bring our needs to you. And Lord, we pray for all the, sort of a week late nearly to be doing this, but not really, we pray for all the children in our church family, Lord, and, and connected to our church family. We pray for the under 18s. Things are beginning to ease up a little bit, I think, just coming up to the holidays. But, but the impression I, I get is that just life can be difficult and challenging. Um, there's lots of, of struggles in the education service. There's lots of struggles with all the different activities and the homework and the illnesses that seem to be rife and the exams and always issues with friendships and just all the tough stuff that our, our children are going through. And Lord, often at such a young age, trying to deal with things and navigate things. So Lord, we really do bring you before them. After a wonderful Children's Day last week, we really do again bring them before you and ask for your help and your blessing. And Lord, ask for your Holy Spirit to just be moving in their very young lives and their very young hearts, even at this stage. And Lord, we pray for illness and struggles throughout the congregation, Lord. We pray for all the different challenges facing people. We pray for the, the illnesses, Lord, for people who are in pain, for people who are undergoing treatment, for people who are recovering from treatment or waiting for results and diagnosis. We just pray for all the different needs, Lord, that are in our church family. And we ask, Lord, that you would, would help us to show up at the right time and the right place to be able to help each other. And I pray that for me, maybe in particular, but I pray it for all of us. Um, and I, I pray, Lord, that, that you would um, just be healing and bringing people to yourself, Lord, and giving them the help they need. And I pray, Lord, for all the medical teams and the medical staff. Sometimes it's a matter of getting to the right person at the right time. So, Lord, I pray for all of that. Like our education system, our medical system is struggling so much, Lord, and we ask for your help. And Lord, that leads us to think of the wider political situation, Lord, we ask for, we cry out to you for help, Lord. We are just really struggling as a country at this stage. We are struggling financially and in terms of provision for our people. Lord, give us the help we need. Lord, resolve things, fix things. Help things that, that, uh, to, to, to be mended so that, Lord, we are able to, to just get the help we need as people, Lord. Lord, we bring all of those big issues before you. And, Lord, we even think, um, I like to pray about farm safety at this time of year, and, Lord, we do pray for that. And we pray for the needs of all the farmers and the work of the farming community this time of year, Lord, that you would be looking after everybody, especially in terms of all the, the silage cuts. But Lord, we also think of a wider of all the forest fires that have been happening. And Lord, we pray that we will, as a people, just be really careful and that the authorities will be able to keep these things under control, that, that our, our land does not get damaged in the way it has been damaged this past week. So Lord, these are all difficult things that do worry us, and we bring them to you, and we ask for your help. In Jesus' name, Amen. Lots of different areas there. And we are going to read together now from John chapter 14, verses 15 to 27. And um, now I have forgotten my glasses. So I have my own version printed out, which is the NIV 2018 or something. You have the NIV 1978. There is a little bit of difference between them. So I'm going to read from this one because I can see it. But, but uh, please do read along John chapter 14, verses 15 to 27. I'm going to be calling the children up soon. Where are the children? Matthew, there is a lot on your shoulders. Matthew and Jessica. Just pay, pay attention while I'm reading this. Oh my goodness. I might bring your mummies up with you as well. So you pay attention. <laughs> right, this is Jesus promising the Holy Spirit to the disciples. And he has just, he has just been, at the very well-known passage, he's just been talking about uh, going to prepare a, a home for them. Uh, in my father's house there are many mansions. So he's just been talking about that. 
And then in verse 15 he says, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, or helper, or friend, to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realise that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, I think that's left at this stage. Then Judas said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. This is God's word. And we're now going to sing together before the children who've been listening really carefully, as have Judith and Kimberly. We're now going to sing together. We're now going to sing together just as I am.
Excellent. You guys are the best. Would you all go and sit there? I'll sit over here. I might bring the microphone. Oh, can I do this? Can I just do this? This is the thing there. I do Well, this is very relaxed, isn't it? Is this is on. This is on. Yeah. Lovely. I'm not booming too much. I feel like I should start singing a country song. It's <laughs> exciting. I've never done that, but I feel I should start. Um, Matthew and Jessica, how are you both? Good. And how was school been? Yeah. And did you go to the sports thing? Yeah. And did you do well? Yeah. <laughs> and what was your favourite sport? Creepy what was your favourite sport? Is it creepy crawling? I was in second and James was the first. You were in second and James was the first. Who's James? He's your friend. He's your friend. Does he go to this church? No. Oh, right. <laughs> I'm sure he's old. <laughs> um, creepy crawling. Do you creep and crawl? So 
of Matthew when you are doing a creek crawl race? Is it? And you go to sleep, he's there. And Jessica, when you're doing skipping, he's there. When you're having your dinner, he's there. And when you're fighting with your brothers, he's there. That's pretty good, isn't it? And then I'm going back to Alistair's point to finish. So there's a few words that are used in the Bible. One is an advocate. Now, this is a wonderful word. An advocate is somebody, Matthew's got that look on his face where he's like, this adult is just keeping talking, but I'm going to be polite and I'm going to keep listening. In a very good sense. But Matthew, I like that polite guy, and I'm all for that. I will try and be very, very quick. So the advocate will argue in your behalf. That's pretty good. If you get in trouble with somebody arguing in your behalf, isn't that great? Would you like that? No, we don't want that. Okay. Helper, he's somebody who will help you. A counsellor. Alistair mentioned, a counsellor will help you make the right choice. Is it always, do you guys always make the right choice? Yeah? <laughs> what? I said You'll tell it to you that's done something. Well, that's, that's okay. That's good. Do the rest of you always make the right choice? Does everybody always make the right choice? No. Matthew and Jessica, that's just you. That's you're the only one. Is. So the counsellor will help with that. He's also a comforter, that's how he's described. He will comfort you. That's pretty long. And then my final one is he's a friend. He's a friend that is always with you and always on your side. Do you ever argue with any of your friends? Yeah. My friends are always with me, so I <laughs> they don't argue with you, you don't argue with them. That's very wise. Well, some of the rest of us do argue a wee bit sometimes. And friendship can be difficult, but the Holy Spirit is always your friend. He never falls out to you, he never goes away. It's Father's Day today. It's Father's Day, that's right. Are you going to do anything for Father's Day? Yeah, I, I was. I got that on Friday, sir. You got a, a, a prize or a present? I'm going to go to You went to McDonald's? You took me to McDonald's for Father's Day. That is so good. And did he write his present? You see, you're actually better coming up here. It's like, it's actually here. I'm like, up here. Right, I am going to stop talking. Can I just say you two have been, I know I, I don't feel like saying you can't be song anymore. I feel like my chat show host. And like, you've been my mess, and you have been delightful, the pair of you. Thank you so much for coming up. I think we're out of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, the Son who came and, and died for us. We are so thankful for him. And thank you so much for your Holy Spirit who stays with us. Um, who are your children, who stays with us all the time, never leaves, never forsakes us. We are so thankful for him. So Lord, bless us now in our time together. Bless Jessica and Matthew. Um, and look after them and be with them and be with all of our children. In Jesus' name and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, now I'm over here. Come on over. I'm
looking at heaven and hell and death and all kinds of things. And I was beginning to think a little bit about the gaps, especially how we're formed and every day as Christians. And then alongside that, in my own time with God, I was getting challenged about my bit too laid back attitude to the Holy Spirit. I mean, I know he is the third person of the Trinity. And I know he is absolutely equal to God the Father and God the Son. And I know that for Christians, he is absolutely key in our love for God and our belief in Jesus. I know he's central in our salvation and our sanctification. That is our becoming more and more like Jesus. Every step of the way the Holy Spirit is there. And I know all of this stuff, but I sometimes act like the Holy Spirit is two and not three. And that is bad. It's a tiny bit, or it makes me think. There's, depending on your own relationship and awareness of the Holy Spirit, you'll have different examples. But, but for me, it, it's a little bit maybe like the children's elephant. Or the elephant I brought. It's not a children's elephant, it's my elephant. But the elephant I brought for the children's address a few weeks back. I really like this elephant. I really do. It was a gift from Richard. I really appreciate it. Back in our elephant buying, we <laughs> bought things like elephants for children. I really appreciate it. And I leave it sitting on the bed in the spare room because it goes and it suits. And every now and again, I'm in the spare room, I think, oh, there's that really nice elephant. And I might pick it up and maybe even give it a wee hug occasionally. And then I just forget about it. And I go on about my day. I think as I was growing up, we were respectful of the Holy Spirit and would have acknowledged his role in conversion. Absolutely. But after conversion, we knew that he then lived inside of us. He, we were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But really, most of the action was done when we got saved. And, and so, growing up, I kind of assumed that the Holy Spirit was a bit like a generator running in the background. He was doing something. It was probably important and useful, but I wasn't entirely clear of what. And I certainly didn't spend any time out back chatting to the generator or involving the generator in my daily life. All of this led me to think that I wanted to spend a few minutes this morning talking to the Holy Spirit. Now for the eagle-eyed among us, and we had this wonderful overview of course last week of the Bible, for the eagle-eyed among us the Holy Spirit has always been in the centre of things. So right from Genesis chapter 1, Verse, verses 1 and 2, we read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Holy Spirit. He is central in creation. As God creates and molds and designs and develops, the Holy Spirit is there every step of the way. And we keep encountering him throughout the Old Testament as the Holy Spirit equips people for the tasks that God has called them to do. So for example, in the construction of the tabernacle, and there's so much detail given to this construction of the tabernacle, but a craftsman called Bezalel is filled with God's Spirit so that he can do this work. Or many years later, returning from exile, we read in Zechariah chapter 4 that Zerubbabel would complete the temple not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Holy Spirit. Throughout the Old Testament, prophets and leaders and judges and kings were described as being filled by the Spirit. Or that the Spirit came upon them and gave them power. It's always happening with um, Samson. The Spirit's always coming upon him and giving him power. And then, of course, in the New Testament of Jesus' baptism, God says, This is my beloved Son, with him I'm well pleased. The Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove. And it's this very exciting Trinitarian moment, Father, Son, and Spirit. And then we come to today's reading. And it's Jesus' final night before the crucifixion. 
And in your final night, you tend to talk about the important stuff. And Jesus spends a lot of it talking about the Holy Spirit. It's a confusing conversation for the disciples. By this stage, I think they are easily confused. They're a bit addled at this point. Because earlier, Jesus has just said he's going to go and prepare rooms for them. And, and they just don't understand kind of what that's about. And then Jesus says he, he, for them that they should love him, that they should obey his commands, and he will send another advocate or counsellor to be with them, who will help them and be with them forever, the spirit of truth. Uh, now, there's a lot of trans... Alistair is going through most of them. There's a lot of translations for this word. And it's really just too big a concept for the English to properly, not for the English, for English to properly translate. It's just there's too many aspects to it. That's why there's all these different words used in different translations. But really Jesus has said, I'm going to send someone to you. I'm going to go, but I'm going to send someone to you. He will advocate for you. He will argue for you. He will help you. He will comfort you. He will counsel you. He is going to be, as Tim Keller says, your ultimate friend. And as our ultimate friend, we see in verse 16, that he's going to help those of us who love Jesus and he's going to be with us forever. That's the promise. If you love Jesus here this morning, the Holy Spirit is going to be with you forever. He's going to be with you forever. And he's going to help you. He's always there as a helper. He will always be alongside you. He will always be for you. He is on your team. He's on your side. He's in your corner. And he will never go home. I was a very chatty child who was alone a lot more than I liked. You don't really have control over these things when you're seven. I was alone a lot more than I liked. And I hated people going home. I hated it. I wanted everybody to always stay. The Holy Spirit never leaves. We're followers of Jesus. He has made his home in our heart. And he is never going to leave there. He will never get fed up with you. Or with us. Everybody gets fed up eventually. Not the Holy Spirit. He will never get bored. He will never decide, oh, I hear this one. It's, this one's just particularly mad. I am just off. No, he will always be with you. And he will always be for you. So the Holy Spirit will be the best friend ever. He will be a counsellor helping us to work out the right path. He will be a comforter when we're in pain. He'll be an advocate who will stand up to argue. We're going to talk more about this arguing just now. He will argue with us as if presenting a case in a court of law. He will be really good at it. And there will be two main things he will be arguing. First, he will argue to give us assurance that as Christians we are sons and daughters of the King. That is something that just slips away from us all the time. So as we read God's word and as we pray, the Holy Spirit will actively remind us of how much God loves us. So in Romans 8, I'm just going to read this, I'm not really going to spend much time in it, but in Romans 8 we read, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. By him we cry, Abba, Father, or Abba is Daddy. By him we cry, Daddy. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit, we are God's children. Now, if we are the children, we are the heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. The Holy Spirit is right there, arguing with the darkness of our own hearts. All the places that cause us to doubt God, to doubt he really loves us, to doubt that he could really be interested in us, to doubt that he would actually stick with us. Even those moments when we wonder if the whole thing is something we have made up off the top of our own heads, 
The Holy Spirit will be a witness to Christians as we spend time with God, that God is real. We are his children and we are loved very, very much. We do have to spend time. Otherwise, it's a bit like, you know, you've, you've gone off to university or something in a far land and you haven't been home for 10 years and you say, I just don't feel as close to my family as I used to. Well, no, we have to go and spend time with them. It's a bit like that with God. We do have to spend time and the Holy Spirit will witness to us that we are God's children. In fact, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 12, we are incapable of genuinely saying Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we are dead in trespasses and sins. There is nothing there. It is only as he works in us that we come to realise our need of Jesus the Saviour. It's only through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives that we have any glimpse that we need God at all. So that's one of the things he'll argue with us. The other thing he will argue is when we go the other way and we think we are fine and we're equally liable to do this. You know, we think we're grand, and yes, of course we're sinful, I mean, we know that, and Joanne keeps doing this confession part in the prayer, and I suppose it's important, and I mean, the world's a mess, and yes, there's problems, but we're not that bad. Our sins aren't that bad, certainly not compared to, to him or to our Well, the Holy Spirit is the one who points out to us, yes, there's a general problem with sin, but the Holy Spirit also points out that you have a specific problem with sin. Yes, you. Conviction of our own sin is a vitally important part of the Holy Spirit's work. Otherwise, honestly, we would just think we were fine all the time. We would think we were lovely. This, this part of the Holy Spirit's work reminds me of the Old Testament account of the Holy Spirit filled Nathan the prophet coming to challenge King David after David has just completely lost the run of himself. David has slept with Bathsheba, he's got her pregnant, he's then killed her husband Uriah. It is a mess. And Nathan comes very, very close to David and tells David this story about a wealthy man with lots of animals and a poor man with one ewe lamb who is treated almost as part of the family. But when the wealthy man is entertaining, he somehow sends for and gets this one ewe lamb. And it is the ewe lamb that is used in the entertaining. And they eat it. I don't know why I thought I'd explain that. The Bible tells us in response to this story, David burns with anger. David's a passionate guy, you can just imagine. He is ripping when he hears this. He says, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And of course, Nathan turns to him and says, you, you are the man. In all our complacency and self-righteousness, as we think of all the dreadful things in the world happening around us, who think we are doing okay, the Holy Spirit ten turns to us and says, you're the man. You're the one. So the Holy Spirit is active in our lives, bringing the word of God to life, bringing preaching and the Bible and prayer to life, giving us a joy as well as a hunger that can only be met in Jesus. For that's really the main thing the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit points to Jesus. For as we read in verse 16, Jesus promised another, another advocate. Jesus is, if you like, the first or the lead advocate, and the Holy Spirit is the second advocate pointing to Jesus as the lead. So as we come to the end of the sermon, the Holy Spirit would want us to spend a few moments thinking about the first advocate. And here I am going to go to Tim Keller, for I think he's very useful in this, and I cannot think how to put it. Better. So I'm just going, going straight to Tim Keller, who of course very sadly passed away recently. So he talks about his own experience and he says you've trusted Jesus. And Jesus is in heaven at God's right hand. And we read that in the book of Hebrews. And he is advocating for us to God the Father. And 
and Keller says over the years after he believed in Jesus, he says initially this was a real encouragement to him. This was great. But after a while, over the years, this began to worry him. Because every day he sinned. Every single day. And often it was the same sins. Over and over and over again. And in this image of Jesus going to God and saying, listen, he is still doing this. <laughs> Can you do a body a solid? Can you give him a bit longer? He, maybe he's just slow. Maybe he just needs more time than other people. Just, just give him a bit more time. And eventually, Keller was really worried that God was going to turn around and say, but it's been years. I can't keep doing this. Keller was helped out of this struggle he was really beginning to face by another good Presbyterian theologian called Charles Hodge, who explained that yes, Jesus is the lead advocate making the case, but the case is not like some sleazy New York lawyer kind of wheedling and saying, oh, just give him another chance, like, he's good for it, he means well. Instead, the case is that Jesus steps up to the podium and he's not pleading for mercy, he is demanding justice, and that's a very different place in which to be standing. So let us imagine this. I'm going to use myself because I'm not going to pick a moment you to use as this. So Jesus is speaking. He's interceding. He's advocating. Father, says Jesus, on the case of Joanne Smith, I know there is an accusation of tedious and relentless ongoing sin in her life. I just want to remind the court that the penalty, the punishment for Joanne Smith's sin has already been paid. The court will remember that I myself took all the pain and the punishment for all of her sins. All of them. None of them were left out. Every single one was included. I took the punishment for all of them when I died on the cross. And therefore, I am here to demand justice. Because a crime cannot be twice punished. Therefore, Joanne Smith must be allowed to go completely free because the penalty has been paid in full. When the Holy Spirit points us to Jesus, he's not pointing to Jesus, shuffling around heaven, making deals. He's pointing to Jesus, the all-conquering Saviour, who took all the punishment we deserved, who suffered as we should have suffered, who died the death we should have died, and who therefore stands in heaven and declares with a ringing voice that he has paid the price, that we who believe in him are free and forgiven. And that he has made his claim on us and he is never going to let us go. And that the Holy Spirit living in us is a constant sign and seal of Jesus' claim on our lives. Let us pray in the power of the Holy Spirit that God will make all of this clearer and more precious to those of us who are his children as each day goes by. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is such an amazing thing that Jesus died for us. It's such an amazing thing that, that you sent your Holy Spirit to be with us always. And it's such an amazing thing to think that Jesus is at your right hand and he is claiming justice and that his claims will be granted because he has paid all the price in full for those of us who trust in him. Lord, for those of us today who are your children, do you make this clearer and more precious to us. May the Holy Spirit be actively at work in our lives, pointing us to Jesus, reminding us we are your children, reminding us that we do have to come to you with our sins. But Lord, it is such a blessed thing that the Holy Spirit is with us. Lord, changing us and helping us to be more and more like Jesus. And Lord, for those who do not know you this morning, through your Holy Spirit, speak to them and challenge them and change them and bring them to yourself. 
Lord, we bring all our requests to you, always, in the name of Jesus, and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, we're going to, to sing what a friend we have in Jesus in closing, when you're offering what we receive.